Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Between Friends. I'm Eileen Roach, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery, and I'm thrilled that you are joining me today. Uh, we are going to talk about tips and tricks and methods of continuous embroidery that you will apply to lettering, borders, and splitting designs. And it really doesn't matter how big your sewing field is or the limits of your sewing field. I'm going to show you a project that was done literally 21 years ago and in a five by seven hoop. And it's a uh, Christmas decoration that I still use. So please sign in. Let me know where you're watching from. I see some of our good friends are here. We have uh, Joanne Banco, Diana Mullins Atkinson. Thanks, ladies, for joining us. And Anna Sidwell from Washington State. Aloha, Judy Warren. So wonderful to see you here. And Diane Constance from Massachusetts. Uh, it's just always lovely. I hope you're all having a nice summer day. Susan Walter up in Wisconsin. Uh, and Esther in Canada. Hello, Esther. Nice to have you here. Nice to have you here. So, you know, continuous embroidery is something that today on many machines is easier to do than it was in the past. But if you are new to embroidery and if you have a sewing machine who has a limit of a sewing field that's say five by seven, or maybe even a six by 10, and you want to do big, 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 big. Well, you can. Um, software helps, I can tell you that. But um, I'll show you some other tricks that you can use. Because when I started, well, literally, there was only a four by four hoop. And when we got a five by seven, we were doing cartwheels. And then from there, in increments, the machines got larger and larger, as you well know. But um, when you learn on a machine that has a small sewing field, you kind of learn, um, you almost become a better embroiderer because you don't have all those bells and whistles. I know you still want to do a lot of these tasks, but you are maybe limited on the machine features. Doesn't mean you still can't achieve a lot of those um, techniques. So let's head over to the overhead cam and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So this uh, issue, is uh, this was an, a holiday issue of designs and machine embroidery and this mantle scarf so that's a mantle right that's going to be about six seven feet eight feet in width and at the time i only had a five by seven hoop so let's take a look at the actual project here it is these letters are really large and of course it says we believe in santa claus santa claus first i did the snowflakes and then just the word we and, and then believe had to be split into, I was able to probably get all of these letters, the B, L, I, and E, and then rehoop for the V and the E. You can see where it overlaps a little bit, not that big a deal. And sorry, there's bells on the bottom of this. And in was a separate hooping. We're gonna be making a lot of noise. And then SA, one hooping, and then NTA, a third hoop, a second hooping for that word. And here we have um, C, L, and the A, and then finally the U and the S, and of course more snowflakes on the end. But all in a five by seven hoop, not a magnetic hoop at that time, wasn't uh, even out, you know, wasn't released yet. It hadn't even been invented. So how do you start something large like that? First, Set yourself up for success by starting with a piece of fabric that is much larger than your finished size. So if this is 10 inches, not, I'm not really sure, but let's say it's 10 inches, I'm sure I started with 14, just so that I would have ample fabric to hoop around. And I took that whole length of fabric and folded up a crease so that I could have a baseline for my lettering to sit on. I wasn't so concerned with the center of you know, a design, how we normally are very concerned about the center of a design, because what was important to me was the baseline. We want all that lettering to sit on the same baseline. And you know, if you can believe it, in We Believe in Santa Claus does not have a descender, but it does have several 
a, us senders. And by us senders, I mean like the L, the B and the L and even the dot on the I that are above the size of the letter. Now, if it was the letter Y or G or P, then it would have a D sender. And that's something else that you have to take into consideration. So a um, lot of fun in stitching this. And, you know, it still does adorn my house uh, every Christmas. Uh, and then there's a, a quilt that, you know, coordinates with it and so forth. It's, I can't believe I'm still using the same Christmas decorations in 20 years, but uh, I am. Okay. Truth be told. All right. I'm going to put this away. Lots of fun with the jingle bells. And let's move on to um, some simple lettering. Okay. But what if you want to stitch, you know, birthday in, on a ribbon? That's going to be, you know, a large, uh, here, let me flip that around so you can see better. That's going to be a big ribbon embellishment. You'll have birthday on one end of the ribbon, and then on the other end of the bow, you'll have happy. And you only have a four by four hoop. Well, you're going to have to create the letter, I mean the word, in two different segments. So let me uh, kind of move the hoop out of the way. And I, I'm just going to use this nice white space here so you can get a good look. So here's birthday. The problem with birthday is I can't fit that in my four by four hoop. And we have an, an, ascend, an ascender and a descender in this word. So if I create in software my two parts of the embroidery design and then I put them together, you can see that my horizontal line is not consistent. Normally, when we're doing borders and so forth, this is how we would proceed across the fabric, you know, aligning that horizontal line. But because what we're concerned about is the baseline of the lettering, you can't use that technique. So you have to print a template and focus on the baseline. But printing a template of the whole word tells you where it has to land within the ribbon because we do want it centered within the height of the ribbon. For instance, if I take just the template birthday and here, I'm gonna move this down here so you don't see what it's already done. And I center the template in the width of the ribbon. And then when I do day, well, my, um, my descender, the Y, is probably going to hit the, the ribbon edge. So that's why it's a good idea to print a template. So how do you get those templates? Let's go into software and take a look at how you do that. So I am in, well, I'm in Perfect Embroidery Pro, but you could be in our Embroidery Toolshed, the free software. And if you purchased one of our font collections, like uh, our luxury collection number six, then you would have the ability in Embroidery Toolshed to create this phrase. So what you would do is um, select the T, which is for text, and then just click on the workspace and type your word in the uh, properties box and click apply. And then you have your letter and I mean your word and you can make that as big as you want. Well, not ridiculously so. You can always check the size of just that uh, design, that, that the portion of the design that's selected by clicking on the transform tab on the properties box. And my height here is 1.04. Now I know that my ribbon is three inches tall, so I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And now I'm up at like 1.3. I think that's, you know, fair enough. That's appropriate. And um, just to create a clean screen, I'm going to uh, do cop, control copy and new and paste. And then when I go to file print, I can print my settings. So we don't wanna do that. I wanna go into file, file print preview and I can change my settings so that I have a crosshair and now you can see I have my crosshair. That's perfect for birth. I would repeat that very same process for day and then print each of those two templates. And that's what would make that so easy. Oh, you're not seeing that. Um, yeah, 
Right. Okay. Well, I can share that. I can just change that and share that. So just bear with me one minute while I change my settings here. And um, I'm going to stop share, stop screen, and then share again. And now you'll all get to see the whole hot mess that I have on my computer. There we go. <laughs> and when I go into software. So let's, I'll just show you what I did. I went into file, print. And that brings up my actual printers that are connected to my computer. If I want to change the settings, I go to File, Print, Preview, and then click on that. And then in the settings here, this is where I can change. Do I want to see it in actual size? Do I want to add a crosshair? The color analysis, which will be printed on the second page, or I could do it all in one page and include artworks if there are any. To get a really crisp print, put a check marks in realistic and stitches so that you see the stitches. And now you can see down at the bottom of the screen, that's telling me my color changes. And I think I can enlarge that so you can see that a little bit better. There we go. And it's telling me it's one color, right? Really simple. And it's Celtic blue is the thread that I have um, selected. And so then I hit close. And then I would repeat that very same process for the word day. And I have stitched my first one, the first part of the design. So let's go ahead and do that. I mean, pull it out of the hoop. So here we are, uh, and I'm using sticky hoop. And this is a, a great hoop for this technique because you are going to need, um, it, it's just so much easier if you can just stick it down. So I'm going to tear this out and just pull it off. And then I'm going to patch that up from the back. So I have another piece of stabilizer and I'll just trim off a little piece to cover. And I'm going to separate that. You know, I have to remove that protective paper. So we just take a second and remove that. And I'm going to flip the hoop over. Now, normally when I do this, I place it on the protective paper, the shiny side, I put that right on that sticky stabilizer, it just protects the sticky surface. And I normally place my hoop with the attachment extending off of the table so that this will lay flat. But because of the camera work here and so forth, I, I can't access that right now. So you'll just believe me, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna patch that from the back and I can uh, place that protective paper shiny side down again, and then give it a really good smooth motion. And that will adhere that second piece of stabilizer to the back. And now I don't have to worry about that separating. And so just remember, we always patch from the back. Okay, so now I'm going to use perfect alignment laser to help me line up the baseline. So I will um, place Pal, I, I hope we're seeing that pretty good. Okay, well, I have a lot of light on in here, so I hope you'll bear with me. And then I just really want to focus. I would have my template in place, and I probably should have had this on a print stick target. I mean, print stick target template paper. Yep. And but I'm going to position this so that that perfect alignment laser is aligned with the baseline of the existing stitching and the new template. And so I can see that that is going to be all aligned. And I might wanna have that a little bit closer so that the H actually touches or kisses the D. And so if that's the case, I could reposition this to make sure that um, that center mark is going to be aligned with the laser. And then I don't have to move it once I'm at the machine, right? Oh, but I have to focus on that alignment, that baseline, right? So there you have it. And then I can just take this over to the machine and make sure that my needle is centered on that template. And it is best if this is taped in place and just adhered as one. Yeah. Let's see. Why is the R shifted? The R? I don't know what you mean by why the R is shifted. Birthday? I'm not sure. Okay. Did I spell it wrong? 
Oh, maybe I put an N in there. Does it say, oh, maybe I did put an N in there. Or maybe that's just the R. Yeah, that's just the R. You know, fonts, they're all a little different, all a little different. Okay, so let's um, kind of move on to um, our next challenge, which is um, borders. And I have a really great example of that to show you. Um, so here, let's just pop into PowerPoint. We already did lettering. So now we're going to focus on this um, tunic. And I have that tunic here. This is one that I made several years ago. I have a lot of fun memories with that. So let me put this mess out of the way and I'll bring up the tunic. Okay, so here's the actual, sh you know, it's kind of a big, blousey, loose um, tunic, and it uh, oh, was kind of a challenge to embroider because it's so silky, right? It's really loose and very oversized, so that was a bit of a challenge. It, it's not a knit fabric, so that was one benefit, right? It doesn't stretch but I most certainly had to tame it with sticky stabilizer or I never would have been able to continuously connect each of these um, designs. And I think there are three hoopings on this. And of course, this is not actually embroidery. This is trim that I added later. So I, I, I stitched some step outs for you to show you the process. Uh, I have a pink towel that I'm going to run this border across the bottom and I've already stitched two repeats. So here's my design. I thought you would like to see exactly what it looks like and um, so it has an inside decoration and then that sat satin border. These placement marks I added to the design and I'm going to walk you through that and show you how to do it. But I want you to notice that on these two designs, what has been stitched is the design and alignment marks at the bottom of the design. So one, two, and three. And, and these two I have positioned away from the design. There is one in the center. I can bring that up to you a little bit. Um, it's small, but I, you know, I, you just need a little mark there. That's really all you need. Now, the easiest way to remove this from the hoop is to cut it out, not tear it, because we don't want to dismantle our placement marks. We need them for our next step. So I'm going to take a cutting mat and not a dime hoop mat <laughs> and place my hoop, my sticky hoop, right on that mat. I've pulled back the template and it doesn't want to go anymore because that's where my placement marks are. So I'm just going to uh, take the rotary cutter and give it a good slice in that direction. And another one here. And at the bottom, do the same thing. And also on this side. Again, I'm just, you know, you always want to make sure you have your fabric out of harm's way, nowhere, nowhere near the rotary cutter, right? And there we go. And we'll just pull that out. Now I have to patch that. And I do have a, um, a piece of fabric prepared so that I can patch, not fabric, stabilizer. I did have one here prepared, but I'll just grab another one. Remember last week, I didn't have it. What stabilizer did I use on my blouse? Gail Brenton wants to know. Well, Gail, I used um, our adhesive sew and wash on that. And you can buy these refill, refill packs that are cut for your sticky hoop in the uh, adhesive sew and wash also. It, the hoops come with, the, um, with our peel and stick but you can uh, also um, use, uh, I could have patched that and I should have patched it, but that's okay. We'll just go and use this whole new piece. All right. So first thing we're going to do is let's go back to software so that I can show you exactly what this process is. So in our software, we want to be in our, um, here's my design. Let me, magnify that for you a little bit. 
and I can select the placement marks. Now the placement marks are available in some of our software and that would be in Perfect Embroidery Pro, Patch and Applique Maker, My Lace Maker, and My Quilt Embellisher. So if you have any of those software programs, you would have this feature. Okay, so with my, uh, in Perfect Embroidery Pro, I'll click on the placement mark icon and I'm going to select placement marks at the top in all three positions and the bottom, all three positions, and click OK. Next up, I want to lock my design, that beautiful embroidery. I don't want anything to move right now. And I have um, all of my alignment marks come in the first color, which, you know, is not where I want them. I want the ones at the top of the design to be stitched first, but the ones on the bottom, I want them to stitch last. So because my design is locked, but the placement marks are not locked, I just selected them by running the cursor over top of them. And then I'm going to right click and select order to the front. And that means it's going to put it at the very top, the very last embroidery design. So there's all three. Now, one more thing. You can see here on the design that that placement mark is going to be stitched on top of my beautiful embroidery. Nah, I don't really want that, right? It's much easier to remove those placement marks after the stitching if they are outside of the embroidery. Now, the center ones, I have to keep in that position because center is center. But the ones on the perimeter, um, I can select and move them. So what I did, remember, my design is still locked. So all I did was left click, grab those alignment marks, and then I'm going to move them with the keys on my keyboard. So I'm holding down the control key and I just keep tapping the arrow to the right until those marks are away from the embroidery design. And I'll repeat that for the left. Now, what happens if uh, for some reason you're a lot, you know, these keyboard strokes aren't working? We've all been there, those things do happen. What you can do is um, you can, let's, here, I'll pull this out of heart, pull it out of alignment. They'll, that's a nightmare, right? We don't want the, to have an embroidery design like that. So very easily I select all and, um, or actually I'll select the outside two and use my alignment keys at the top and say top align. And that brought this one on the left back in position. Now I wouldn't want to do that and include the center one because it's not as tall as these outer ones. Okay, so now I'm happy with that. Now I'm gonna send that to, to the machine and I'm gonna stitch it. So I already have that up on my machine and I will stitch that first color of the embroidery design. And we'll lower the presser foot and we're gonna stitch that. And it's just going to stitch those three placement marks. And it ties off after each one, so it takes a minute to stitch them. And then we are um, going to, I'm going to show you how we're going to hoop with PAL. This is so slick. I love this. My favorite thing. You know, it's really fun to be able to, you know, trick the eye that you have a giant sewing field, right? Well, you know, I could do this towel. This is going to be 18 inches worth of embroidery, and I can do it in a five by seven or even a four by four hoop if I'm willing to rehoop. So we remove that, and now I'm going to place this under PAL. Let me flip that around so you get a better view. And what's important here? What is important is that the um, horizontal line is aligned with the top of those marks. All three are in alignment. And that vertical line is aligned with that center mark. That's what's important. So then we're going to take our towel that has been um, embroidered already. And we can kind of 
you know, when I cut that, I didn't do such a great job. I'm just kind of tearing off a little bit of that tear away in the design area, just so that we don't stitch over it. Okay. So then I'm going to take my towel and I am aligning the vertical line, the vertical line with the center vertical stitch mark and the horizontal line with the bottom of the alignment marks, these placement marks that were stitched with this design. And, you know, you can, you know, this is sticky stabilizer, so I can reposition that tail until I'm really happy with the placement and smooth all of that out. And you can place your template back on top just to confirm that this is what is going to stitch next. And you can see that my vertical line of my laser perfect on PAL2 is aligned with the template as is that horizontal. So now I'm just going to head over to the machine. I'm going to, I have to rethread and we're going to stitch color one, which is the yellow. And then we're going to move on to another project and, and blah, blah, blah. That's going to stitch and you're going to get to see the end of it. But um, in the meantime, uh, there's a couple, um, there's a couple uh, other tasks that you can use perf perfect alignment laser for. So we'll let you take a look at that. Isn't that pretty cool? I mean, there's so many different things you can do with perfect alignment laser. Now, uh, Heather Hogan asked, what's the difference between PAL and PAL2? It's really the size. So PAL1 is a small gooseneck lamp um, that I, I'm sure we have here somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah, we do. Sam, it's hanging up on the board. And uh, PAL2, we have an image of that that will show you because I'm using mine, I can't get it into the camera space. But PAL1 is smaller. This does extend down. Um, because it's short, it doesn't uh, project a long beam. You can get a long beam if you elevate it, place it on a box or something like that. But, you know, easy to use, easy to travel with. You can store it. You know, you can, like, you know, turn the coil, rotate it like that. And it's battery operated. They're included, AAA. Uh, batteries. Uh, so just absolutely fabulous. I love both both PAL 1 and PAL 2, but PAL 2 to me is a superior product. It sits in my hooping area at home, which I call my hooping throne. And that's the only clear area maybe on my cutting table, right? Or, you know, right next to it where I hoop. So I have my hoop mat and I have PAL 2 attached to uh, you know, the table and illuminating over the mat so that when I put my hoop down, it's not going to move. Mm -hmm. And I love what Joanne Banco said. She says that uh, she's always said that you can embroider from here to the moon when you know how to connect designs correct accurately. And boy, she's not kidding. And she's probably done it herself. I have seen some of her beautiful things. So let's see, Kimberly Cummings, you want to know, could you use the laser on the Solaris? You know, the Solaris has so many wonderful features for connecting designs. 
and uh, making continuous embroidery. But if you don't have a Solaris, then you won't have those features. And really the laser on the Solaris gives you pinpoint positioning of the needle. But you have to know where to place that fabric. So that's how the sticky hoop and PAL2, they work together so that you are putting your fabric in the correct position in the hoop. You could then attach that hoop to the Solaris and confirm the positioning with that laser. But, you know, that's, again, a, you know, just a dot. And, and the, the, the line laser that the Solaris has is really for sewing. And I'm sure Joanne Banco could correct me if I'm wrong on that. How wide is the PAL2 clamp? The PAL2 clamp is... Um, we, um, well, it, it, are you talking about like it's bite, you know, how far into the table it goes? I think that's two and a half inches and it opens two and a quarter. So I hope that answered your questions. And maybe at the end, after I'm down, done using it, I could take that clamp off and show you, Susan. Okay, that would help you. Okay, so we also want to go over to a, uh, a split design, which is a little bit more complicated, right? So let's take a look at, um, oh, what happened? We have, it stopped. What? Oh, it, we're just going to tell it to just keep stitching. The, the thread broke, just like at home occasionally, the thread breaks. It broke here too. But I know you want to see that this actually did a really nice job. So just hang on. Well, I changed thread. You know how that goes. Well, I rethread. Of course, on the Solaris, it is a, um, it's very easy to rethread, right? Just with a button. Yes, how wide the clamp will spread, Susan. Yes, yeah, so it's two and a quarter inches is how wide it will spread. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, a really pretty design. Look at this nice large design. And of course, if I had an eight by eight hoop or a nine and a half by nine and a half, I could do that design in one hooping. But if I only have a five by seven, I still want to decorate the center front of a t-shirt, right? So um, I can split this design if I have software. Let's go back into Perfect Embroidery Pro. And here is my embroidery design. Uh, it is... Um, what size is it? Let's see. It's seven, 7.2 by 6.5. So that is definitely not, go not going to fit in my seven, um, my uh, five by seven hoop. Blah, sorry. Okay. So in Perfect Embroidery Pro, you will find the split design icon. And when you click on that, you have this wizard that is really quite handy. And the first thing it does, you, I have to tell it what hoop I'm going to use. And you have so many hoops to select from. And you can, of course, customize the hoops that are listed here. You can remove ones that aren't applicable to you. And you can add um, hoops that are your favorites. So make it yours. So I'm going to do that Baby Lock Brother 130 by 130. And then that's what this 1-1 one, 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 and 2-1 means. So that means hooping 1 and hooping 2. I can move these boxes. I can. Well, what I'm doing actually is moving my embroidery design around so that it is in one area, uh, one half of the sewing field and the other half. But let's just see what the software is going to do on its own. So I'll hit split preview. Wow, it's almost perfect. So what I really wanted to do is split down the middle, right? I want to get, let's call this a peacock's eye. It's not really, it's a paisley. But, you know, I want all of that little swirl and this little swirl and that little swirl to stitch in hooping one. So it's easy for me to move that. I can just click again on split preview and now I can move my design just a little bit and I didn't get it all so we'll just repeat that process and you know it's just a click or two so it oh and maybe I'm going in the wrong direction so let's go back and now move it to the left left a little bit we're getting there we're getting there we're getting there 
maybe we weren't getting there. <laughs> All right, let's try that. There we go. Now we really have the complete half of the design that I want to stitch. And to verify that, I can see everything on the first hooping. And then if I want to see everything on the second hooping, I just click to view. And that's all I'm doing. I'm not moving anything at this time. If I want to move it, this again, then I would hit split preview yet again. But can you see the little eyeball that is attached to the cursor? So that's telling me that um, I I'm just looking at this design right now. I'm just previewing. I cannot move it. If I were to hit this, then I would be able to move it. But we know that we were happy with that, right? So I'm not going to move it anymore. I'm going to hit save. And um, oh goodness knows where I am now, but we will say um, uh, Paisley and say, okay. And it's going to create a folder for me with the name that I assigned Paisley. And here's my first design and my second design. Let me make that a little bit larger. And you can see that it is um, my two designs. You also get a PDF, a preview that will show you each design. Now you'll notice there's a funky little stitch in there now, right? See this long design? That, I mean, this long stitch, that is going to connect with our other second hooping. So I'm going to uh, ungroup this so we can take a good look. Now, our software is smarter than us sometimes. So, or it thinks it's smarter than us, or maybe I'm not as smart as the software and I just have my own method of hooping because I have, you know, PAL2 and I have my sticky stabilizer and so forth. So let's go back into the software up close so you can see it. It drops in two placement marks at the actual outside of the design. I don't need them. So I am going to um, select one of them, oh, and well, both of them, and get rid of them. I'm just going to delete them. All I care about is this line. That's all I care about. And I will also open up the second design, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get rid, of, I'm going to ungroup it. And you know, that grouping is really, it's handy. It's so, you know, if that's our default, it comes in grouped, it's a great thing. So now you can see that the alignment mark is on top of this design. It's not a bad thing. So I'm going to copy it and paste it so you can see how it's going to connect. There you have it, pretty cool, huh? I'll change the color of that so you can see the difference where they're going to connect. And um, we can go to the overhead and take a look. But, you know, I seem to be having some sheen problems. It doesn't want to stitch. So um, I think we'll just come on out of here. We'll cut that thread first. And um, the first two designs stitched just beautifully, as you could see right on my sample but I can take this under the camera so you can get a good look at it and you can see how nice it connected. So why don't we do that right here? Sorry that it didn't get to finish, but you can see my flowers are all lined and then my satin would just come in and connect. So I'm really happy with that. That's great. I'm going to, you know, put, I'm going to give this up. We'll cut this towel down and we'll use it another day. I'll just cut off that part. I'm not going to worry about, um, I'm not going to worry about patching this or anything because later on I'm going to show you how you can clean off this sticky residue from your hoop. So we'll, I'll save this one for the end of the program. All right, let's take a look at this beautiful design and how that was split. So here's what it would have looked like on a large template if I had a really big hoop, right? But I don't, right? I'm telling you today I'm limited to a five by seven. So here's my first design that I have already stitched. And you can see that red alignment mark. And I'll be able to pull that out. It's stitched on top of this design. So it's going to be easy to pull that out. And I have already stitched the first color of the second design. 
and that is that alignment mark. So I'm going to turn PAL back on. I had this stuck on the table, but it moved away for, from me. Okay, so I'm going to line up that center mark with, uh, line up the horizontal beam with the centering mark on my hoop because they're right on there. And then I'm going to take my previously stitched design and position the center of that and align the um, vertical line with the stitched line. And I'm going to stitch that. I'll take that over to the machine now and stitch it. And just bear with me a minute so that we can um, change the design and change the thread or I, I guess I, well now I do need to put it in another color because that yellow you're not going to see on this light um, embroidery. There's color one, hoop one and now we need hoop two. Okay, just attach that to the machine. And change that thread one more time. And I guess I can just use black so you can really see how it's going to connect. All right. And we'll hit embroidery. And so, so I am, I'm going to stitch, you know, color number two, right? Of course. Uh, all right, and we can just let this roll all the way through. We'll hit our monochromatic button so it stitches both portions. There we go. Isn't that fun? So easy, right? So easy. Okay, I'm just going to flip that back so you can get a good view. All right, so that's just going to keep stitching. Let me see what kind of questions you have while we're here. Oh, yeah, Joanne, you know, my, my machine wants a uh, vacation. I think you're right. It definitely does near that. Let's see, uh, Kirsten, you, you're telling Judy that you can use all, all designs with, from all sorts of sources. You sure can. You can use any embroidery design in Embroidery Toolshed. Um, you'll have the most uh, sizing ability with confidence if you use a C2S file, which is any embroidery design collection that you purchase from Dime includes the C2S file. That's the native format of our software. So that means you can really expand and shrink a design, you know, within reason. But you can do a lot of that with all other um, formats also. Yeah. So let's see. Um, Joy, uh, is there a reason that the magnetic coop can't be used? There's not a reason. It's just super easy to use the sticky stabilizer with the sticky hoop and PAL. It's just very easy. Let's see. And is there an easy way to get rid of the stabilizer on an open design? If it's an open design that you don't want the stabilizer, you know, you want it removed, you don't want it in there permanently, then I would suggest that you use the sew and wash, the adhesive sew and wash so that you can just wash it away. Because, you know, any kind of tear away, whether it's sticky or not, it's going to be really, really hard to tear that away from the interior of a design those tiny little areas, you know, it really doesn't matter what kind of, you know, if it's just regular tear away, it's going to be difficult to pull that away. So if it's important to you to get it out of there, then use an, a water soluble stabilizer for sure. Okay, so let me show you how to, um, how to use, uh, how to remove that state, the kind of gunk, right? So you're going to have the wrong side of your sticky hoop and you're going to pull off the excess stabilizer. Now, truth be told, you know, I don't, I don't remove a lot of these. Now it's not really sticking uh, really bad to this hoop because frankly, I just cleaned this this morning, but um, I'm going to show you. So I use mineral spirits. And I'm going to, I'm going to put some gloves on so that I can just throw them away and I don't get those mineral spirits all over this fabric that I'm using in here. And just, you know, a, an old rag, dish towel, whatever, and mineral spirits, here you go, just right out of, you know, any big box store, they have mineral spirits. 
You might want to do it in a well-ventilated area. It does have an odor, uh, you know, outside or just in a, I do it in my kitchen. And you're just going to rub that mineral spirits against that adhesive. And it's going to kind of come off. You can see it's like pulling off right now. There we go. And the, the heavier buildup will take a little bit more elbow grease, but not much. You'll get it. And what I find if you wet it all down with the mineral spirits, right? So get a nice amount on there and, you know, apply it to that sticky adhesive. And then when you go back, it's, it will have softened up pretty easily by then. It's just that initial application that really lets it um, work into the adhesive and then it's easier to remove. Now don't do this on a granite countertop because it could harm your sealant that's on your gr granite countertops, but any other surface, it's just regular mineral spirits. And so there you have it, pretty easy, huh? Not bad. And just work from the back. Keep the mineral spirit stuff on the back. Don't you don't want to rub it on your adhesive rulers? And all nice and clean. Wasn't that simple? Yeah. Soak in Dawn. Trisha Sidewell, you of uh, Trisha Phillips, you could soak it in Dawn, but you would probably ruin your adhesive your rulers, your placement rulers that are on the front side of the hoop. So I would suggest not to soak it in Dawn. But, you know, Dawn is, solves a lot of problems at home, right? It sure does. It's great, great product. So, uh, yes, Anna Sidwell, you most certainly can use uh, mineral spirits on regular hoops. In fact, I could show you that because that hoop that I was showing you earlier on the mantle scarf, oh, my, I was kind of horrified at it because it had a lot of... Uh, a lot of residue on it so and that's probably spray adhesive on there and but that comes right off too I found you know I was uh, really cleaning a hoop re recently and I learned that if you wipe it down with the mineral spirits and then if you really want to get it out of those crevices you can use a, um, a toothpick to get in there yeah, to get in those really tight corners. Like, let's say you're selling a machine or something and you really want to make it nice for the, the buyer, then you would do that just to get all that out of there. And it comes up really, comes, comes up really nice and clean. So there you have it. I mean, super. Okay. Uh, let's see. Gail, you use, uh, you spray original Windex cleaner on yours and it works great. Well, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I never thought about using Windex. Might have a better odor. Aroma, should we call that an aroma? Odor sounds so negative, right? Yeah, so we're really stitching along pretty nicely there. I can't wait to get it over off the machine and show you. So I'll kind of clean up some of this mess I've made here. So when we bring that back, And it smells like mineral spirits in here. <laughs> it's so pretty though, isn't it? And let's see, little alcohol prep pads work well too. You use several, but less messy than the mineral spirits. That's a good idea, Susan Basler. Yep, I, uh, alcohol prep, I hadn't thought of that. I've used um, baby wipes for sure. Yeah, oh, and Anne, you're like me. Um, you rarely use any other hoop except a magnetic hoop. Well, I agree, but, you know, I do have some hanging around. <laughs> Let's see. And Gail, you say you leave the Windex on for about 10 minutes and it peels off the stabilizer easily. You know, so let's talk about peeling off that stabilizer or, you know, it, when you're ever, whenever you use an adhesive product, whether it's a spray or a stabilizer, always test a small portion, you, you know, in an inconspicuous area on the item that you're about to embroider on. For instance, some bags, you know, like pur purchase bags, blanks that you uh, would be embroidering on, on, you know, they 
maybe they'll have difficulty separating from that adhesive. And on a bag, you know, like let's say it's on the inside flap of a cooler, you know, a thermal bag, something like that. You really do want to remove all of that excess stabilizer around the perimeter of the design. So just test that first before you actually use the uh, stabilizer with that product. Mm -hmm. Let's see, uh, Diana Mullen. Ak Mullins Atkinson says that we all put her to shame. She hardly ever cleans the back of her sticky hoop. No problem. No problem. And Risa, how often do you remove all the sticky stuff? Hardly ever. Hardly ever. Really. There's no reason to do that. This, its only function is to be a sticky hoop. So, you know, you don't have to clean it, Risa. If you got uh, more important things to do, don't clean the residue off of your hoop. It's not going to harm it. You just have to make sure that you have that residue covered with a fresh piece of stabilizer. That's all you have to worry about. Yep. Okay. Let's see how that design is doing. It's just about done. And you're going to love how nice and perfectly matched this design is. And apparently this machine either likes this color thread better or this fabric or this design, who knows, but didn't seem to like the other one, right? Okay, so we'll put this right up under the um, camera. Isn't that fabulous? So here is hooping two, this was hooping one. And if you remember, the red line was stitched on top of hoop one, and underneath, that was the first color of this uh, second hooping. And because we aligned that underneath PAL, this came out just perfect. So I'm very happy with that. Very happy with that. Uh, let's see. Lisa wants to know, would the cleaners dry out the plastic or not on long enough? Do you mean the hoops, the, the, the plastic hoops? I don't think you can harm those plastic hoops with that kind of, with cleaning. They're fine. They're, they're not going to be harmed for sure. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I know it was, it is pretty, isn't it? Uh, Judy Warren, that design is from our uh, Paisley's design. Let me see. Where's the, my library? It is Paisley Perfection. They're beautiful designs in there. Are we in software here? Yeah, you can see just how beautiful they are. I can bring in some of them. They're gorgeous. They're just beautiful. And they are digitized so well. Tiny little running stitches. They all kind of remind me of henna designs, that beautiful temporary tattoo artwork that we see on, um, you know, uh, you know, different cultures that celebrate by expressing with uh, henna. I just love that. Aren't they beautiful? And they're so delicate. They're fabulous on linens. They're really great on lightweight t-shirts because they're so lightweight. And um, you can copy, paste, mirror, make a big, you know, expression of beautiful embroidery. Okay. So what, else? well, you probably still want to know that it's Hoopapalooza, right? So let's go ahead and jump into um, the uh, PowerPoint. And did we lose that, Sam? No, here we are. Okay. So these were the designs that we just stitched. PAL 2 is on sale today. There's been a huge uh, drop in the price point down to $59.99. And um, it's also still Hoopapalooza. So if you've been waiting to get a hoop, whether it's a Snap Hoop Monster or a Sticky Hoop, this is the time. If you spend $75, you get free shipping and all hoops are on sale for the month of June. So kind of encourage you to take advantage of that for sure. Yeah. Um, and it is also, you know, last week we covered our new hoop compatibility chart. And I wanted to tell you, you know, if you haven't checked it out, it's right there for you. You go to dzgns.com. And when you use, uh, click on the tab for hoops, that photograph that you see there with the red arrow, that will jump you right to the compatibility chart. And uh, you can view it online. You can download it if you want, but you don't have to. And when you view it online, there is a table of contents. So you can jump right to your brand of uh, machine hoops that you'll need. And all of the hoops are, 
you know, on multiple pages by brand. And when you um, are actually in that, uh, if you select one of those hoops, then the compatibility chart will jump you to the shopping cart so you can easily find that exact hoop that you were interested in. You know, it's confusing, right? There's a lot of different hoops, a lot of different machines. So we've really tried to simplify this for everyone. We get questions all the time and, and not all of our staff and boarders. So not everybody has the answer, but we feel that this new compatibility chart really does simplify those questions and and ask, answers all your questions. Okay, it's on the house. This week, you know, June is kind of all patriotic and we kicked it off with a firecracker napkin uh, ring. And this month is ice cream, we scream, we all scream for ice cream. It's just an adorable red, white, and blue ice cream cone. And um, it comes with eight different colors. You know, some of it is shading, right, on the cone itself and on the ice cream. So please take advantage of that. Imagine putting that on a T-shirt with some fun wording or maybe a baby onesie, like ice cream, we scream, we all scream for ice cream, just to add some lettering, uh, you name it. Or even a quilt block if you're doing um, small placements or something in that manner. So I hope you enjoy it. And we can't wait to see your project. So please go online onto social media, whether that's Pinterest or Facebook or Instagram, and tag your photo of your on the house design with on the house or dime so along. And we'll see you here next week with my guest. She's really coming next week, Salima, ja Salima Jaffers. I said that it was this week and I was wrong. And she gave me a big, whew, thank goodness that I had the wrong date and she didn't because her son graduated high school this week. So she's a little busy, but boy, we're going to have a lot of fun next week. So I hope you'll join me here at one o'clock central time next Thursday. Thanks for joining me today. It was a pleasure spending an hour with you.